Muchas gracias. Buenos días, señores y señoras. Yo entiendo, yo necesito hablar lento por estas personas aquí habla sola inglés. Chiste. I have been asked to speak slowly in English so that the translation in Spanish uh, proceeds properly, but I don't see too many people listening to translation, so I'm going to speak like I usually do really fast, because I think I have how many minutes? Five minutes? To talk about 5,000 years of history. The point I want to make is the part of the country we're in and the part of the country that many of you are, the part of the world, excuse me, that many of you are from, are areas that Spain colonized and Spain claimed and Spain claimed it under the doctrine of discovery that we, this whole conference is about. What is it? How can we work to w get rid of it and to roll back the negative uh, impacts of it? One point I want to drive home to you is that Spain was very legalistic in its application of the doctrine of discovery. Far more than any other of the colonial powers, England, France, even Portugal, etc. in North America and Central and South America, Spain applied law that they drafted repeatedly, and I will cover some of these issues. But what I'm going to start out with is, of course, the international law of discovery that we call the doctrine of discovery. I'm going to explain it very, very quick, quickly. I talk about the ten elements that I define or that I have perceived make up the doctrine of discovery. And then I will try to point out how Spain applied that in Central South America and this southwest part of what is now the United States. So the Doctrine of Discovery and that name Doctrine of Discovery comes from the first United States Supreme Court case about Indian issues and tribal issues. The United States Supreme Court decided in Johnson v. McIntosh that North America was settled by the English primarily under the doctrine of discovery and conquest. The, what did that mean for native peoples, for the indigenous peoples of North America? Well, the court said they immediately lost some of the rights to their land, magically, without any consent, without any consultation, without any payment, or even without knowledge of indigenous peoples. They lost the full ownership of their land under Anglo-American or English and American property law. What else did the doctrine of discovery do to indigenous peoples? Well, they immediately lost, again, without their knowledge or their consent or any agreement with these Europeans that showed up, they immediately and magically lost some of their sovereign powers. The right, according to the United States Supreme Court, to engage in international diplomacy and international trade were the two primary examples the court talks about. So somehow, just because Europeans showed up with their flag and their cross and planted it in the soil, they were making a legal claim. And I want you to remember, the doctrine of discovery is about law. In fact, the doctrine of discovery is probably the first form of international law that was developed. Gosh, what is international law? Well, it's the agreements that the international community develops how governments will interact with governments. That's, what, that's really a good definition even today of international law. So how did these European countries decide among themselves to divide up the world? Boy, that's pretty nice. Steve, you and I ought to define how to divide someone's house out here. So if you and I can just agree on it, <laughs> then we can, you know, take your property. Wow. What a unique thing. But this case has been enormously important. It's been cited dozens and dozens and dozens of times by the courts in Canada, by the courts in Australia, by the courts in New Zealand. It's even been cited three times by what's called the English Privy Council, which is the highest Supreme Court in the United Kingdom in England. It always cited about colonization and the power of the white, non-indigenous government to control the indigenous peoples. I'm not going to explain uh, that opinion anymore because we just don't have time. What I'm going to explain to you briefly are the ten elements that I, after reading Johnson v. McIntosh 50 times, these are the justifications, the ten elements that make up, I think, the doctrine, the international law doctrine of discovery. First. And this was primarily developed by the Catholic Church and by Spain and Portugal. In, starting in the 1340s, 
primarily uh, being solidified in 1436 when Pope Eugenius II issued, I believe, the first papal bull about actual colonization and European power outside of Europe, granted the Canary Islands to Portugal to control and convert the wild men, that's quote unquote, the wild men of the Canary Islands. The Canary Island peoples were denigrated by the Spanish and the Portuguese. You can read the identical definitions of what were said about American Indians and the indigenous peoples around the rest of the world by Spain and Portugal. Why these Canary Island people have no law, they have no agriculture, they have no clothes, they have no money, they don't speak our language, they don't have laws. Well, the vast majority of those things were lies, weren't they? But those were the same kind of justifications that have always been described about American Indians and indigenous peoples elsewhere. To lower, literally folks, that's one of the elements of racism, of the definition of racism, is to somehow set yourself apart from the other and then to lower in your valuation the way they live or their law or their ethics. And that's exactly what the Spanish and the Portuguese were doing. Boy, I'm going to need more than 30 minutes. I'm still on element one, aren't I? Element two. And this, Spain and Portugal objected to this element. It's really England and Queen Elizabeth I in 1487 that developed this idea of, um, uh, excuse me, 1587, that developed this idea that a European country had to be an actual occupancy of these lands they had claimed, or England would then claim them. Spain and Portugal objected to that, and you'll see why. Uh, Spain and Portugal, here's the other th two elements I have here. What did Europeans claim when they showed up and stuck their flag and cross in the soil? I mean, they knew native peoples were living there, and that had, they had a right to remain there. But the Europeans claimed the sole right to acquire those lands from those native peoples, if there ever was any sort of transfer of possession. And so we call it preemption because that European country that showed up first, that was the European country that claimed this right to acquire the lands from the native peoples. Native title, the United States Supreme Court uses the phrase Indian title a couple times. Courts of the states in the U.S. use this phrase hundreds of times. What did they mean by that? Well, what limited title ownership to the land did the indigenous groups retain? And of course, we've already shown it's a limited title. Sovereign and commercial rights, we already mentioned that. Johnson v. McIntosh says the indigenous rights were limited somehow, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Contiguity. When a European rowed ashore and stuck a flag and a cross here, how big of an area were they claiming? And I'll show you in a map in a moment, and I'll show you two maps, and we'll talk about the element of contiguity. Terra nullius, that's Latin for the earth is empty. Primarily, this claim was made by the English in Australia. It was not used as much by Spain in this, the Southwest and then Central and South America, and it was not used too much by the United States and England in North America. But in Australia, the English claimed the continent was empty, terra nullius, hence England claimed ownership of the whole continent of Australia. My, I ran out of room, so here's three elements on the last step. Conquest. I will talk about that. Just war. This is absolutely a Spanish development and a legal principle of the doctrine of discovery. And Spain and Spanish uh, uh, theologians and lawyers and popes and kings were involved with developing this idea of conquest and the rights that indigenous peoples lost because of that. I don't even have to explain to you the last two, do we? Or do I? This has always been used as justification for Europeans to cross the ocean, claim the whole world because their religion was better than ours and because their civilization was better than ours. Uh, I think the United States continues to use arguments like that today. Can you remember a decade ago when we invaded Iraq? Do you remember a lot of the language that was used that Christianity could be taken to the Middle East, and I don't think the United States used the word civilization, but we were going to take democracy to the Middle East. Those were literally those same two ideas, that the United States is superior 
and can take this, these ideas to the rest of the world. Now I'm going to show you two maps. One, uh, and so I'm talking about contiguity now, aren't I? I need to go back a little bit in history. After fighting over the Canary Islands and in, in receiving that papal bull in 1436, Portugal continued to explore down the west coast of Africa and wanted the Pope to justify Portugal's claims in Africa. So in 1453 and 1455, Pope Nicholas V issues new papal bulls granting Portugal the rights to not to control, Christianize, and civilize these wild men of Africa, but also now to acquire sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title over these new lands. So Portugal was delighted with these papal bulls. Spain was cut out of this first era of exploration overseas. And so when Columbus shows up at the court of Isabella and Ferdinand and says, I think I can go west, and I think I can find lands to the west, King, Isab uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella sent Columbus forth under seven documents that you can still read today. And I have the quote here, and I'm totally lost all my notes now, <laughs> so I don't think I can find the quote. But they said he, they had sent him forth to seek and acquire new lands. And they promised him, and I can quote this, quote, we will make you the admiral over any lands you acquire for us. So what did we learn in school Columbus was doing? We all thought, or we were all taught he was headed west to find good spices and cinnamon and pepper and stuff, right? No. Well, he ultimately was hoping to get to China and the Japans, but he was primarily looking for new lands to the west to claim for Spain. So the moment Columbus lands, uh, what, Hispanola in the Caribbean and a couple other islands, he rushes back to Europe. Spain goes to the new pope, Pope Alexander VI, and says, okay, we found new lands that only have heathen, indigenous, wild men. Give us these lands like you have been doing for Portugal. So in 1493, Pope Alexander VI issues four papal bulls and he divides the world on this dotted line that you see on the map. This is a perfect example of the contiguity element of the doctrine of discovery. That dotted line, I think, was 500 leagues west of the, Ca the Azor Islands and the Pope granted to Spain all lands west of that line to control, civilize, Christianize, and to acquire sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title. And he granted Portugal all those same rights west of that, or east of that line, excuse me. If you know your world history pretty well, you know who did the first colonizing in Africa. You know who rounded Africa and did the first colonizing in India and Japan and some of the islands in the Pacific. And you know, gosh, what language do we speak in South America, Central America, Mexico, uh, uh, Spanish? Wow. Well, Spain and Portugal argued about these papal bulls because they were concerned about the actual line. And so the very next year, in 1494, Spain and Portugal entered the Treaty of Tordesillas. And they moved that line 500 miles to the west. And so that's the bright red line that you see there because Portugal wanted a bit of South America. Gosh, what language do they speak in Portugal, folks, or in Brazil? See, I gave that answer away, didn't I? So now a little bit of world history is made a little clearer to you, isn't it? It's the legal history of the world, and it's the legal history of the application of the doctrine of discovery, primarily by the church and Spain and Portugal. England and France became involved a little later, but the doctrine was pretty much solidified by the church, Spain, and Portugal. Once uh, Spain and Portugal started entering the Pacific, they had to decide where that line that Pope had drawn went through the Pacific. So in 1529, at the Treaty of Zaragoza, they drew the line, as you can see, through the Pacific. It literally split Australia in half and that was well recognized for well over a hundred years. When the English first claimed Australia with Captain James Cook in 1770, he only claimed it to that line of demarcation. I have the map of the United States here. 
Every aspect of the growth of the United States is explained by the doctrine of discovery also. What's the parameters of the Louisiana Territory? What's the boundaries of where I live now? I am moving to Arizona to start teaching at Arizona State in August, but as of right now, I still live in <laughs> where I was born, Portland, Oregon. What's the dividing line of the Oregon country? What's the definition of contiguity under the doctrine of discovery? It's the drainage system of the major rivers. The Louisiana Territory is the western drainage system of the Mississippi, and the Oregon country is the drainage system of the Columbia River. These, this aspect, this element of the doctrine of discovery was used to define these territories. Africa, I, I had begun research on Africa and how the doctrine of discovery was used there. I have not finished that. So let's return to Spain and the Spanish legalistic development of the doctrine of discovery. I've already described how the, the church was involved, the church divided uh, various the world for the Spanish and the Portuguese, but even so, Spain continued very legalistically and using the ten elements of discovery that I'm talking about. Columbus himself immediately commenced what's called the encomienda, in which native peoples were enslaved to Spanish landowners. This occurred in the southwest here where we are too. It was incorporated throughout the entire continent, North, South, Central America. So this is one of the elements of the doctrine of discovery. It was a limitation on the commercial and even human rights of indigenous peoples. Now, the I brought a few copies of an article that I'm happy to hand out for free. I primarily focused on Chile and how Spain applied the doctrine of discovery in Chile. But Spain used those same principles everywhere it went throughout the New World. In fact, as I said to you, Spain was very, very, very legalistic in its use of the doctrine of discovery. A great debate arose in Spain about the doctrine of discovery and the papal bulls and whether indigenous peoples were humans and whether they could own property and property rights. You may know Bartolome de las Casas and Juan Sepulveda had a very important debate about whether indigenous peoples were even humans. Probably the most important legal scholar, though, that got involved with this issue in Spain is Francisco de Vitoria who was a Dominican priest, an advisor to the king, who I think at that time was the Holy Roman Emperor, so think of his influence, and was a professor at University of Salamanca, one of the leading universities in the world at that time. He wrote and lectured in 1532, in fact, the title was On the Indians Lately Discovered. And he was debating with himself, I guess, and advising the crown, what rights do the in peoples of the New Worlds have, and where does Spain have any right to have an empire in the New World? He came to three conclusions that some professors say are, were literally the beginning of international law and that are still international law about indigenous peoples today. The three conclusions, I'm going by my memory here, because what did I do with my notes? His three conclusions were that Native Americans possessed natural legal rights as free peoples. Boy, that's a pretty startling idea for a, a Spanish legal advisor. Secondly, and this is really odd for a Spanish priest, a, a Catholic priest, he said the Pope could not grant title to Spain in the New World because indigenous peoples are humans and own the natural rights of property and self-government and dominium was the Latin word for both sovereignty and property. But so it sounds like he was almost being a traitor against the Catholic Church with that second statement. But what he was really doing, folks, was supporting Spain in its argument with the church. As you well know, earthly kings argued with popes all the time over power and sovereignty and Spain was in the middle of a conflict with the Pope over who was really the boss. And so what Di Vittoria was doing was supporting the King of Spain in an argument against the Pope. But third, his third conclusion is why people say he didn't change the doctrine of discovery and he really didn't turn his back on the uh, papal bulls. 
De Vitoria said that if Indians, if indigenous peoples violate European law of nations or international law, then Spain could attack them in a just and holy war. Oh, I'm getting the sign of five minutes. I have 300 years of history yet to cover. Okay. So, well, let me get to the point about how legalistic Spain was then. The kings of Spain were very concerned then about their alleged uh, justification to the new world. So various kings established laws and established commissions to draft the laws about the new world. And when I told you that Spain was the most legalistic of all the conquerors, there was no question of that. Because you can read the 1512's laws of Burgos, B-U-R-G-O-S, which I believe is a city in Spain. They made the, the very next year, they drafted the Requeramiento in 1513, which required the conquistadores to read this document to indigenous peoples before they attacked them and killed them. And the Spanish conquistadors would read this document sometimes from the boat, and they'd read it to the land, or they'd read it into the beard, as the Spanish express, and they'd read it real quiet. And what did the documents say? The Pope has given your lands to Spain. The Pope has appointed a new king for you, the Catholic king, or the Spanish king. Think about this for a moment, but if you don't accept these principles, we're going to kill you. Now that is what they called holy war or just war. Now I don't know if this will surprise you, but the United States Congress in 1787 enacted what's called the Northwest Ordinance, and it says, the, the United States would never take the lands or property of Indians without their consent unless in a just or lawful war. So the United States adopted this Spanish legal principle of just war. And the Requeramiento told the, the conquistadores how they could, when they could attack. The laws of Burgos didn't last very long, and neither, I guess, really did the Requeramiento, because in 1542, Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, now remember what that means, is that he was the emperor over most of Europe, continental Europe, he drafted the new laws for the new world. And those laws from 1542 incorporated the encomienda system, incorporated several of the elements of the doctrine of discovery, and applied them everywhere that Spain uh, was trying to conquer and colonize. So that's even the Philippines and lands in the Pacific, and of course, our, this hemisphere. I told you that I focused primarily on Chile in this article, and so I looked at many, many of the laws in Chile, the actions by the government and the church in Chile, and how they used the ten elements. A couple of my ten elements, I say mine, a couple of the ten elements that come from Johnson v. McIntosh were not used by Spain, and then sometimes either by Portugal and Brazil because of the differing circumstances. But I would say at least eight of those ten elements that I gave you were applied directly by Spain and by the crown in Chile. In Chile and in much of the New World, the new laws from 1542 required indigenous peoples to work nine months of the year for Spanish landowners and then required them to work three months of the year on their own farms to support themselves. Well, that sounds like the element of doctrine of discovery that the limited sovereign and commercial rights of indigenous peoples. When you enslave people, that certainly sounds like you have, are taking dominance over them. But in Chile, very interestingly, and I don't know how much further it went beyond Chile because I really only focused there, but there were laws passed in which Spain did support the local caciques in some instances. And in what they defined as Indian towns, if the Spanish hadn't yet gone there, they encouraged and supported the caciques to lead and to still govern their towns in some ways, even with criminal and civil jurisdiction over various aspects. The doctrine of uh, contiguity was used in Chile dramatically. Uh, the Spanish claimed the entire continent. Isn't Chile about 3,000 miles long? And what's funny, if you know the history of Chile at all, the Mapuche people were unconquered for 300 years. They fought the Spanish off, and they lived south of the Biobio Bio River for over 300 miles. So there were no Spanish at all 
So Chile goes boop, Chile goes boom, 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 and then 300 miles, and then Chile claimed, of course, the Straits of Magellan, where Ferdinand Magellan had come around South America in 1521 and claimed it, went ashore and did that charade and claimed the Straits of Magellan. So Spain was, and then Chile was using the contiguity argument, even though the Mapuche people and nation held 300 miles of what is still modern day Chile. Do you know about Easter Island? And you know that the indigenous peoples of Easter Island have been arguing against colonialism and Chile's control. Well, Chile claims Easter Island under all 10 of the elements of the doctrine of discovery. Okay, well, I, I will wrap up very quickly. I, I hope I've explained to you a little bit the doctrine, the 10 elements. You can see the application of the 10 elements in your own countries and in the histories of colonization around the world. And this, of course, is what we're up against. Johnson v. McIntosh is still a well-accepted case in the United States and in several of those countries in the world. In fact, the United States Supreme Court cited Johnson v. McIntosh as recently as 2005 in a case that the Oneida Nation brought regarding their lands in New York, in upper state New York. So we have a lot of work to do, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers today. Thank you very much.